Uh, welcome to everyone on this call this morning. My name is Bruce McKellar. I work with MSU Extension down in the southwest part of the state. And today we've asked uh, Kurt Steinke to talk a little bit about some of the challenges we've seen with uh, nitrogen. We've certainly had plenty of rainfall across much of the southwest and west Michigan and other places in Michigan as well with the flooding up in the Midland area. So we've asked Kurt to come in and talk a little bit about managing end loss from flooding. So Kurt, we'll get started with you. Thanks, Bruce. I uh, hope everybody fared the uh, storm front that came through yesterday afternoon. All right. I got a lot to go over today. We're going to try to condense this in a perfect amount of time. So I'm just going to get going, uh, talk a little bit about some of the issues with uh, managing end loss from flooding. So, you know, one thing we know, dry areas are getting drier and wet areas are getting wetter. Uh, so you can see from the photos there, you know, some wheat, you can see the ground starting to, to shrink, crack versus picture that I got from Bruce about a year or two years ago, I guess now. You know, the picture on the right is becoming a little bit more common, especially in this, it seems to be in the southwest part of the state, obviously, to catch some of those fronts coming through. But some of these areas, probably a little bit uh, north towards uh, Gratiot County, Isabella County, seems to be a little bit more common. Also, coming through that central corridor through the state and up north to the bay. And so, you know, we're not going to solve this problem probably overnight, but I want to give you some some pointers on what to do and maybe perhaps how to do it to, to kind of figure out a roadmap on where to go. And so, you know, can end that is lost eventually be found? That's probably one of the ultimate questions, depending on what part of the state you're in and what soil texture or soil type you are on. So we know this end loss has become a much more regular concern, much more regular occurrence. Couple key points, it's a really good time, if you don't know, to start knowing your fertilizer characteristics and what got applied and how quickly it may or may not transform to nitrate. And also a good time to start to know some of your soil characteristics, uh, water holding capacities, things like that, because that can play a huge role when you start calculating leaching losses. But we need to have realistic expectations when we attempt to quantify some of these end losses. We're not gonna pinpoint an exact number down to the pound or probably even to the five or 10 pound range. That just doesn't exist, but we can get maybe a better idea on how much and was applied and maybe a percentage that may be lost or still available. And then understanding some of those growth characteristics of specifically corn to know whether it can catch up to some of that end that may have moved away out of that rooting zone. It's also a good time to uh, begin to know and understand some of the primary end loss mechanisms, whether you're talking about leaching on our coarse textured soils, whether you're talking about denitrification on our finer textured soils. And so again, the ultimate question is, is end still available? In other words, lost or within reach? And it's just moved a little bit deeper. So what can we do about it? We're going to go over a little bit today on maybe how we can guesstimate or estimate some of those end losses. Another way of looking at it is can we adjust or uh, quantify our lost yield potential so that then you can either cut back or increase that side dress or rescue end application. That's another way of looking at it if we can't get a good gauge on uh, quantifying that exact poundage of end loss. And then I'll wrap up a little bit, is that rescue end application worthwhile? So this is what creates a lot of the uncertainty that we have out there is soil variability, okay? Specifically horizontal variability. We've done a much better job in the last five years or so of recognizing and acknowledging this issue you know, with, with uh, uh, drones uh, and uh, photography. We've done a much better job at capturing some of this horizontal variability, even though it's been around for decades on soil maps um, that, are now, that are now digitized. You can get a lot of this. And why is this a concern? It affects your drainage patterns, okay? And your drainage patterns are going to then affect your end loss and your end loss mechanisms. What we fail to acknowledge is then, we think it's all about horizontal variability, all right, but the vertical variability is just as important, if not maybe in some cases more important. And this is one thing where you can talk about modeling and computer models and drones and aerial photography. We don't do a very good job at capturing vertical variability. And in Michigan, this can change quite quickly. So you start talking about that stratification of your A, your B, your C horizon and the makeup of each. That can also change on a dime 
as you go through a field with some of those changes in topography. And that too will affect your drainage patterns, which then will also affect your end losses. So both of those factors are huge in determining both your leaching losses and your denitrification losses. So we'll start here quickly looking at fertilizer in. All right, so have an idea of what gets applied, uh, how it gets applied and what is in it. So if you look at a lot of our end sources are mostly applied as ammonium, specifically if you're applying ammonium nitrate still or ammonium sulfate, or it becomes ammonium when you look at anhydrous or urea, um, those both become ammonium in the soil. So our leaching losses with something like ammonium are not too big of a concern in the sandiest of sands, some of those sugar sands that have probably a CEC of one, two or less, it can be a little bit of a concern of ammonium losses, but it's not gonna be the large component. We'll step down the line here and look at nitrification. All right, those end sources above need conversion to nitrate before loss occurs. I can't emphasize that enough, all right? And that occurs across most soils. The one exception to this rule could be urea and when you get large immediate rainfalls after application. So urea is a non-charged molecule, it doesn't have a plus and it doesn't have a minus. So when you spread urea and you get some of these three, four inch rains and larger, immediately after application, I'm talking within a couple days, you can actually move that urea quite quickly through uh, the soil profile and potentially out of that rooting zone. The other area of concern here is if you do go out with something, a urease inhibitor on your, your urea and you top dress it on, you know, you're, you're taking the right steps because urease inhibitors are meant for that topical application. The thing with urease inhibitors, it'll keep that urea in that non-charged form for a longer period of time. All right, so that's something to consider. We've seen it on our wheat crop many, many times where we use a urease inhibitor and we get a large rainfall within a couple of days. We've actually moved that end much deeper in the soil profile. So that would, those would be the one or two exceptions uh, uh, with regards to uh, moving end in that soil uh, that isn't necessarily nitrate. Now, when we talk about nitrate, we know this nitrification process, this conversion to nitrate occurs fairly quickly in our well-drained warm soils, requires a little bit of oxygen. I'll talk about that here in a second. And so all ammonium converts to nitrate at some point in time in the soil system, all right? And that nitrate is then subject to a couple of loss mechanisms, but it doesn't mean it will. It doesn't move by itself, right? It needs water to move. So know your fertilizer composition and know what percentage might be ammonium or nitrate at the get-go, and that will, again, help you a little bit with calculating some of those end losses. So nitri nitrification at various soil temperatures, all right, it does occur at cool temperatures. Um, so you can see something at, you know, around 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. It might take something like urea anywhere from about three to four weeks to primarily convert to nitrate. And when you bump that temperature up, that soil temperature up, that can drop considerably. So, you know, that nitrate conversion factor, you can see this box off to the right. Nitrate conversion occurs about twice as quickly for each 10 degrees Fahrenheit above 50 degrees. So for example, if you went out and applied urea and it was about 50, 55 degrees Fahrenheit, it may take you know, anywhere from about 24, 27 days to have a large percentage of that, of that urea in that nitrate form. So you wanna look at, did you get a big rainfall within a day or two after urea application, 10 to 12 days, or was that in that three to four week scenario? Because if it's that three to four week scenario, you might have a large percentage of that urea as nitrate. Now, if you went out and applied urea and it was 70, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, soil temperature, all of a sudden, instead of three to four weeks, you're talking probably four to seven days, you would have that urea fully converted to nitrate. Much different scenario than when you have the cool temperatures. So nitrification occurs at both cool and warm temperatures, occurs much more quickly at that warmer temperature. So talk about those end loss mechanisms. Denitrification is a, a, a large end loss mechanism, typically on our no tile or poorly tiled or low lying areas. 
All right, so here we're not necessarily talking about your coarse textured sandy soils. We're talking about those other parts of the state. And you can see what that denitrification process is. It's converting from nitrate to N gas for that N uh, gas loss mechanism. Uh, so when soils become waterlogged, when they become saturated, oxygen is excluded and you get these anaerobic conditions. All right, how does this occur? How do you know if you have denitrification occurring? You need about 80% of your pore space filled with water. All right, that's the first component. Second component, you got to have microbes that have a carbon source or a food source, organic matter. Third, you got to have temperature. Okay, typically temperature will drive those denitrification and losses. They tend to peak, you know, when we get in those air temperatures that are 75, 80 degrees and higher. But like I said, it can occur when it's cooler. This is a little bit different than when you start talking about flooded plant survival. When you have soil temperatures of about 75 degrees and you're flooded for about one to two days, young corn can make it about one to two days and that's it. When you're a soil temperature of 60 degrees, that flooded plant can survive up to about four days all right, underwater. And this is about V6 and younger corn. A little bit different than denitrification, but I wanted to throw that, that factor in there. The fourth ingredient for denitrification is you got to have nitrate. All right, if you don't have nitrate present in the rooting zone, you're not going to get denitrification. All right, so that's why you got to know what you applied. Was it UAN? Was it urea? Was it ammonium sulfate? Was it anhydrous? And then how quickly that converts to nitrate. So you need all four of those ingredients for that peak denitrification. So when do these losses start? Typically about one to two days after saturation. All right, and how much nitrate gets lost? Rule of thumb is about 5% of the nitrate gets lost per day of saturation. So not necessarily 5% of your total N, about 5% of the nitrate that's in that system. So again, this goes back to knowing your fertilizer composition and how quickly it may convert to nitrate. So I threw an example up here. If a grower applied about 150 pounds of N as UAN, just prior to a large rainfall, and that ground was saturated for, for five days, you would know that UAN is about 25% nitrate, right? When you apply it, it's about 50% urea, 25% ammonium, 25% nitrate. You take that 150 times 25%, you'd have about 37 and a half pounds of available nitrate right after application. So if you get a rainfall right after application, take that 37 and a half, multiply it by about 5% and loss per day, round a saturate for five days, you would end up with about 10 pounds of N lost. Now, if you change ingredients here, let's say you went out and applied something like urea, all right, 150 pounds of N as urea, and let's say it was three to four weeks after application, you probably would have a very large, if not complete conversion to nitrate. So then you're talking about all nitrate, you take that 150 pounds, you multiply that times uh, 5%, and you multiply that times, let's say, five days, you'd be looking at about 38 to 40 pounds of N that was lost. So that's why it's really important to know that fertilizer composition. So that's how denitrification works. That's how quickly you can get some of those N losses and how that length of saturation really plays a role in determining some of those denitrification and losses. Now on the flip side, if you don't know what was applied, you don't know when it was applied, something like that, not sure, you can start looking at saturation and your yield losses. Typically when corn is saturated at V6, we're losing about six to 11 bushels to the acre per day. All right, so this may play a role when you start talking about that rescue end application and how much should you go out. Take a look at what your yield potential was. Hopefully it was a realistic yield potential. And then you can back off that yield potential and cut back on that end for that side dress end application. Now, when we get saturated corn for about five to seven days at V6, many times we see a complete or near complete loss of the crop. So in a case like that, that rescue end application probably may not be worthwhile. So that's where, you know, there's a very finite window there. Uh, you talk about a couple days of saturation versus a week, a big difference in the overall performance of that crop.
Here's left from June 2015, where we had one of those, I believe we had about eight inches of rain over three day period. This is in Ingham County, that spotchy, like I like to say, yellow appearance in those low lying areas, you're looking at denitrification. You got a little bit of a weed problem going on there also. Uh, but you see those are denitrification and losses. You'll get the spotchy, patchy, yellow appearance in the field in these low lying areas. You know, kind of looks in some cases a little bit like sulfur, but remember sulfur would be much more likely to appear on your high areas of the field, some of those sandy knolls and knobs. Picture in the lower left, I always like to joke, can you find the tile line and where it's located? Now here you look at, we got the interface of corn and soybean. All right, it's important to notice the difference between denitrification and wet feet or wet roots, or in some cases, lack of rooting. You can see we're seeing the same issues on the soybean where you get outside of that tile line versus uh, as to where we are seeing that yellow corn. So in a case like this, it would appear to me to be much more of an issue with, you just don't have an established root system yet on that corn or that soybean when you get outside of that tile line because of those wet conditions. So as the soil in, in that lower right photo would dry out and you get the, the heat units, you would probably likely see a little bit of N or a little bit of crop recovery, and that crop recovery will allow that plant to uh, uh, begin to green up and uh, change appearance. Now, on our coarse textured soils, we're talking a little bit more about nitrate leaching, all right, which is that downward movement of water containing nitrate out of that rooting zone. So key thing here is it has to move water and nitrate out of that rooting zone. So nitrate in and of itself is very soluble, it's very mobile, going to be subject to those leaching losses. A couple of factors are going to impact your leaching losses. One would be your rate time, source, and method of N fertilization. So again, know that composition of that N fertilizer, your intensity of cropping, your crop N uptake, the timing of those losses will play a huge role, whether it's V2 to V6 <clears throat> or something like V8 to V12. Those soil profile characteristics will also play a role. The higher percent clay will reduce those losses. So look at that soil map. Do you have a clay layer in that sandy soil that's maybe 15 to 18 inches beneath the surface that might hold some of that nitrate? It could be a possibility. And drain tile could potentially increase some of these uh, uh, leaching nitrate losses. So that quantity, uh, timing of precipitation may play a role. You can look at that, that front that came through yesterday. Some of us got Know, upwards of an inch of rain in a very short period of time, or do you get three to four inches of rain over three to four days? Big difference when you talk about wetting fronts pushing that nitrate beneath that rooting zone. Leaching is not a quick process in our medium and our fine textured soils. So here we're talking, you know, you get to your CECs of eight or nine and higher, you know, we, we, we fear those leaching losses, but it's not a quick process in those finer and medium textured soils as compared to some of those coarse textured soils. Now, on those coarse textured soils during those large rainfall events, one thing to remember is not all the water moves past the rooting zone, all right? We get this three, four inch rain, we always think everything is gone, all right? You will lose nitrate, but you're not gonna lose all of your nitrate. On those finer textured soils where we do get some leaching, you're looking, you know, rule of thumb, now is probably about four to six inches of nitrate movement per inch of infiltrated water, all right? So you gotta figure out how much water penetrated and infiltrated the soil surface, or was it a very dry environment and you got a three, four, five inch rain and you got a lot of runoff, all right? Big difference in that nitrate movement. So you can plan on about four to six inches per inch of infiltrated water. On our coarse textured soils, it changes quite a bit. You're talking about probably six to 12 inches of nitrate movement per inch of infiltrated water, all right? So you need to have some idea on how much nitrate was present in that root zone before those rain events. And so again, it comes back to know your fertilizer composition and know how quickly it may have converted to nitrate. Another rule of thumb to go off of, and this applies to a little bit more on our finer textured soils, is if you can calculate the water holding capacity. So if you look at something like a medium textured soil, <clears throat> uh, you know, let's say a silt loam, uh, and you look at that top 24 inches, that top 24 inches of a silt loam, you know, you look at about a 55, 60% 
uh, pore space. When that pore space is full of water, okay, you can probably hold about four inches of water. So anything beyond that four inches would be considered drainage water. All right, so that's another rule of thumb, but that only ap applies to our finer textured soils. So in some instances, you'll see some, some uh, rule of thumbs or factors or conversions out there that if you look at the amount of drainage water and multiply that by two, you might get the distance nitrate has moved in a medium textured soil. So again, silt loam, if it can hold four inches of water in that top 24 inches, anything above four inches would be considered drainage water. So let's say you got eight inches of water over three days. If that silt loam would hold four inches, you'd be looking at an additional four inches of drainage water. Multiply that by two, your nitrate may have moved about eight inches or so. So when you get nitrate movement, you know, within about that top two feet of soil on our coarse and fine textured, you know, corn specifically will probably find that at some point in time. It will depend on those conditions after that flooding. So nitrate can move past that rooting zone and still be available. Why? You get these drying conditions and you get the upward wicking of water and water's gonna take nitrate with it. So as those soils dry out at the surface from the sun, you'll get this upward movement of water and nitrate upward through that soil profile. When you get to this time of year, June, July, and August, you're talking this upward movement of water of about a third of an inch per day, all right? And that third of an inch will bring some of that nitrate with it. So yeah, what is lost can then be found based on this upward movement of nitrate through that soil profile. So ultimately it comes down to, you know, do you have end deficiency from plant stress? Corn specifically doesn't like to grow with wet feet or wet roots, right? You gotta get that, that, that rooting system established to tap into that end. Or is it due to lack of end? All right, and it's an issue we have to separate out on a field by field and even site specific within a field basis. So it's very difficult to separate water management from nutrient management because we need water to move into the plant and you need water to move in away from the plant. So what to do after large rainfall events? In many cases, you're not gonna be able to soil sample, right? Because things are so, so saturated, you're not gonna be able to walk out into the field or take your four wheeler or ATV out, th out to that field and sample. The other issue, if you can sample, is can you sample deep enough, right? After a large rainfall event, we're no longer talking about uh, zero to eight inch soil sample, we're talking several feet, probably more in that two to three and two to four feet foot range. So figure out if roots are present and are they present at that specific depth. And remember, you need about four factors for uh, nutrient uptake, roots, oxygen, water, and that nutrient itself. So. Wrapping up here, a couple things to look at. Things are gonna be different by the year, right? So if you look at 2019, remember how wet it was early in the season? A lot of us had a difficult time planting early in the season, all right? So we had a tough time getting that, that corn plant established and those roots established. 2019 was one of those years where we had root problems early, but then we saw this midsummer drying. Okay, a little bit of a droughty conditions midsummer, which allowed for some of that upward end movement from water from those lower depths. Yields, you know, they weren't great in 2019, but they could have been much, much worse. Compare that to something like 2012, where we had early season drought conditions, followed by mid-season drought conditions, where we saw very little upward movement of nitrate in that profile, and yields suffered dramatically. So, Rescue N, yes or no, this last slide I got today, comes down to remember rescue N and late applied N are not similar terms. With your standard practice of late applied N, that late vegetative application, knocking on the door of R1, we haven't seen tremendous yield benefits. Rescue N is a different scenario, right? You're trying to save your investment. So with rescue N, try to get out there ASAP to apply. Your dollar returns on that rescue N application often exist up until about tasseling. <clears throat> if you're tasseling and beyond, we rarely see yield benefits to that rescue and application. Your yield increases are gonna depend on the severity of your end losses. It's only gonna be effective if you have sufficient rain after application, all right? So you gotta you know, look in that crystal ball, what does that, that, that uh, two, three week forecast look like after that rescue and application? Remember, up to about three days of, fl of flooding, rescue end can be quite effective. Up to about seven days of, of flooding, rescue end may not be worth that investment. 
how much to go out with. Remember, if you broadcast something like urea, you can probably get away about with about 90 units of N up to about V4, V5 corn without getting too much damage. Once you get to about V8, you're looking at about 60 units of N or so or less. If you tend to uh, use UAN, uh, remember, decrease uh, those N amounts if you mix it with an herbicide. And with UAN, don't broadcast UAN with your Rescue N application. Look at drop nozzles, wide drops, drag hoses, something. Just don't look at that broadcast N application. Don't forget, you know, how corn uptakes N. So, you know, you start talking about some of these, these, these large rainfall events early in the season. You know, your N, N uptake up to, you know, about V6 is only about 10%. All right, so you don't want to throw in the white flag, the towel, et cetera, early in the season. You know, we don't start taking it up in earnest till that V6, the V10 scenario, and then especially right before uh, the, uh, VT, so that V10 to V14 stage. So, you know, we always get concerned about, about you know, the, the plant losses early in the season, not necessarily, you know, soil nitrate movement. But again, the, that plant uptake early in the season is relatively minimal up until you get to about that V6 to V10 window. All right, so that's a good thing to think of. And then the only other thing I threw up there was just, you know, a little summary. I went through about five or six papers looking at what to expect when you get some flooded corn by growth stage and how that plant will respond. So you can see it kind of builds on each other. What you see at V1 will carry over to V2. What you see at V2 will carry over to V3. But you can see already at V2, you do begin to see some reduced nutrient uptake in the leaves. You tend to see a little bit of uh, uh, decrease the number of years per plant and that grain weight. And then those symptoms just get worse. Uh, in some cases as that flooding occurs later in, later in the season because that grain yield potential begins to get set in stone by the time you get to about that V4 to V6 window. And I think that's about uh, all that I had. All right. Well, thanks, Kurt. We do have a, uh, at least one question here in the chat pod, uh, so I want to read that if, for everyone if I can. It's uh, I think it's from Vicki Marone, but it's, can you please address uh, N when manure and compost are used as an N sower? So I think what she's wondering is if you've got an organic source of material, what's likely to be the loss under those kind of circumstances? Yep. So when you talk about organic materials, first thing would be when was it applied? All right. So you want to think, was it fall applied? And what conditions was it applied in fall? And then, you know, the name of the game is how much of that has converted to nitrate. Uh, so when you start talking about organic N, it will convert uh, uh, fairly quickly to inorganic N under the right uh, environmental conditions. So again, you get above that 50 degree soil temperature, things will occur fairly quickly. You start talking about fall applied N, it would depend, or fall applied uh, manures, it would depend a little bit upon um, those uh, environmental conditions during fall. Did you have a warm protracted fall when a manure was applied a little earlier in the season? Because believe it or not, you can get some of those organic sources to convert quite extensively to nitrate before going into winter. And so again, that becomes the name of the game is what were those conditions like at application and soon after application, and then try to figure out how quickly some of that organic end would have converted to nitrate. So um, throw an idea out there, you know, that, well, what if I use something like a nitrification inhibitor on my uh, organic end, uh, thinking about manure, does that mean I can then apply when soil temperatures are warm enough to convert uh, uh, organic end to nitrate? And no, it doesn't work that way. Um, if those soil temperatures are warm enough, things will convert to nitrate going into that winter season, which is not something we want. We want that nitrate to stick around in that rooting profile come planting time, not going into dormancy or going into that winter season. Fantastic, Kurt. And we have another question. Would your comment about rescue treatments on corn grain change when speaking about corn silage? And he also would kind of wanted to think about quality in that discussion. So I'll, I'll deflect some of that answer perhaps to Phil. So I don't work with corn silage much. My comments will be primarily directed at corn grain, yes, um, and some, some of those grain quality type issues. Uh, Phil, do you have any comments on, on uh, silage? Well, when you consider 
that a lot of the silage yield is tied to the corn grain. It certainly follows the same pattern that you'd have with corn maturity, yield, and the, all the same things that you talked about uh, earlier on, Kurt. One of the things that I've seen is that when you have a lack of nitrogen, there is a challenge with crude protein sometimes, but you've got to get below our normal levels significantly before that happens. So I don't expect that there would be a lot of difference between corn and corn silage when you talk about the loss of nitrogen or nitrogen uh, leaching or def nitrification, I should say. Uh, another question, are sugar beets similar in their uptake to N? I mean, is that curve about the same then in terms of time of year, uh, Kurt? Uh, good question. That curve will be a little bit different. So beets uptake uh, a, a, a larger percentage earlier in the season because we don't want that N uptake later in the season simply due to those sugar quality reductions. And so that will be a little bit different. Um, so that would probably be a little bit different of a, of a focus as compared to corn. You'd probably be looking at much earlier in the season and some of those issues. You know, the big thing with something like sugar beets, we don't want a lot of nitrate sticking around in that rooting zone late in the season because of that uh, reduction in sugar quality. So, you know, in, in some cases we want that, we want that soluble end source around early in the season. The problem we get into then is, yes, it's much more subject to end losses. Beets tend to be take a little bit more of a beating with some of those, those uh, large spring rainfalls than something like corn from both the seed size perspective and the viability of that plant. So there's a whole nother gamut of issues with sugar beets as compared to corn. So that's why I, I you know, kind of separated the two. Today. Hey, another question, Kurt, is how does corn respond to VT or just prior to or just prior to end application? So the later the later application window. Yep. So when you talk about that later application window, you got to look at it as a best management practice. We haven't seen these tremendous yield increases with those later applications. Oftentimes, again, when you get those later applications, you need rainfall really soon after those later applications. You can look back at the last several growing seasons, we get these six to eight week windows sometime between June 1 and September 1 that you know we might be getting an inch and a half of rain over six weeks and that's it. So if you don't have the rainfall after that late vegetative or early VT application, that it's not gonna pan out. So there's, again, that's why I emphasize there's a difference between using that late vegetative as a standard management practice as compared to a rescue application. Rescue application, again, you're trying to get out there, save your investment, get a viable crop. Not necessarily looking at, at that as a best management practice. So again, we've seen yield reductions several times with those late vegetative applications and or we've seen uniform or e uh, equal yield as compared to that V4 to V6 window. So again, it depends on that rainfall after that application. But again, from a rescue application, that's a completely different scenario as compared to a standard management practice. Fantastic, Kurt. Hey, uh, Kurt Thalen was on and he asked if, it, if you're not too short on time, can you comment on the practicality of using in the soil test to get an estimate of fertilizer and losses? So yeah, uh, the end soil test. So you know, there's many, 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 many issues with end soil testing. One being it's very fluid. So I can take a soil nitrate test, you know, standing on an active field, and I can move three feet over, and it can change five to ten fold, right? And it may change if you take it at 10 a.m. in the morning versus 2 p.m. in the afternoon. So when you look at soil end testing, typically we look at it more from a perspective of you applied manure or a biosolid, some sort of organic end source, and you want to look at how much of that source has converted to nitrate. All right, and that's where something like that PSNT testing really comes into play. All right, when do we test uh, or when do we take that pre-citrus pre nitrate test? Typically, when that soil begins to mineralize organic nutrients, and again, you're talking about the early to mid part of June. So that's what that's really used for. The PSNT test is not something to go out into a specific part of the field and take a test and then determine how much nitrogen I should apply. 
all right it's kind of a misuse of that test you know I've seen I've seen people kind of look at that PSNT test and take it in one part of the field and if they don't like the number well I'll just go to a different part of the field because I know I'll get a different number it's kind of a misuse of that test that just test is primarily aimed at organic or biosolid treatments and trying to determine how much of that organic end has nitrified to nitrate and then you can look at that nitrate value and we have set parameters for how much of an end credit you would get for that specific nitrate value. Fantastic, Kurt. Thank you so much. And thanks for doing this uh, presentation this morning on, on nutrients. And uh, we all know that we have moving targets, especially with the with the rainfall that we've had here. So this is an important uh, discussion. I do have a couple of other questions in the chat pod. And I don't know if, Christy, are you able to uh, visit a little bit about the Extend Dicamba registration uh, cancellation this morning? Sure. So as most of us know, the e or the Ninth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals basically vacated uh, three of the dicamba products that are used in Roundup Ready Extend soybeans. So those would be Extendamax, Fexapan, and Ingenia. And uh, basically this last week, EPA came out and came out with kind of two different things and what this actually means for Michigan growers. So right now, um, there are kind of two guidelines. One is that the distribution or sale of any person by any person is generally prohibited um, except to ensure proper disposal or return to, to the registrant. And then the second thing is if you already have one of these products in hand, you can go ahead and use your existing stock. So if you're a farmer and you already had purchased and you have in your control as of June 3rd, the Extendamax or uh, Fexapian or Ingenia that we're gonna use this year, you can still use what you have on hand. So also that goes for commercial applicators. So um, from the Michigan Department of Ag and Rural Development, we can still use those that we have already in hand and purchased. Um, and that ruling goes through uh, July 31st. So that's, that's the positive thing is if you, if you have the product. Um, if you don't have the product, um, you're gonna have to start looking for some alternatives. And today I'm gonna put, have a, just kind of a quick article looking at what potentially some of those alternatives are that you can use. And um, really we're looking at probably trying to control things like water hemp, palmer amaranth. Unfortunately, in a Roundup Ready Extend system, if you do not have dicamba um, already, or those products, um, it'll be really difficult for you to control mare's tail. There is one caveat to this. The one product that was not named in that lawsuit was Tabium. So that is a product that can still be used and purchased. So um, basically they've kind of vacated the three straight dicamba goods and then there is Tabium which is the combination with Dual. And so um, I'll have an article out today that kind of talks a little bit about that. Thanks Christy. We've had a couple other quick questions. I, Chris, can you uh, comment a little bit if you're, if you're able to on uh, what to look for for uh, alfalfa weevil and in regrowth alfalfa. So I have some quick pictures if that would help. So this is an example of light feeding that you would see with alfalfa weevil. And you can see the date on this was May, was May 31st. So you, you, know, you still get a little bit of feeding. This is what heavy feeding would look like where you get that kind of frosting across the field. Now this was earlier, this was May 9th in 2009. So that light feeding, that was you know just kind of like a standard population, but alfalfa weevils are cold tolerant. They're coming out fairly early. Uh, so when you, when you tend to get heavy feeding, it's before that, that first cutting. Here's a, a larva that's close to pupation. Again, it's that end of May, but here in that bad field, you know, this is the number you get in a sweep net in a, in a heavy, population. And here are pupae uh, by June, and, and another example. By this time, I know one of the questions was, well, you know, where would alfalfa weevils be at this time? They would be completing development for the most part in southern and central Michigan. If there are still larvae around, they're the bigger ones that are eating a lot. Uh, but if you can cut, if you haven't cut cut yet, you will kill most of them. And then you very uh, carefully watch the new growth because if they fall off, they're hungry, they're on the ground and they'll eat whatever is trying to, to uh, grow. And that threshold for the regrowth is six to eight larvae per square foot. If you don't want to count larvae, another threshold is just to look at the new tips and see if 25% of them are damaged. But a lot of times they're eating those tips, so they're gone. You might not even know that 25% are damaged because there are no tips, essentially. 
Uh, but cutting does a really good job. So once you get into that second growth, you really should be ending because they'll pupate and the adults then uh, estivate, which means they go to sleep for the summer, like we all want to do, you know. So they just go to sleep and uh, you don't... Um, they don't feed anymore, unlike our other insects that have another generation. So we're sort of ending al alfalfa weevil now. Perfect. Is uh, how how about uh, armyworm? I know we we talked a little bit about that on on the uh, virtual field day for wheat with Dennis Pennington yesterday. Are you seeing any uh, any reports of armyworm? What size are they out in the field? I've right got now? a um, I've got a couple calls this week. They were from that southern tier of Michigan, and they were uh, corn that we had a rye cover crop, and the rye cover crop wasn't killed in a timely fashion, or or it regrew, and and so they were sort of predictable kind of situations. In Mason, I was in Mason at the wheat farm on Thursday, Friday, and the very few armyworm, a few, and they were like. I'm using the tip of my pinky here, and I need a ruler because I can't do this. They were less than they were less than about, about half an inch, so uh, they weren't very big yet. But again, armyworms hit or miss. They kind of get you know brought in by us, move on a storm front, or fly in, and one field can have them, and one field may not because of a weed, grassy weed kind of history or cover crop history. You just have to get out in the field and and look. If you're in wheat. They're, they're down on the ground during during the day, and you kind of shake things around. And when they're small, they're a little bit hard to find. So, Chris, would you would you think that we have more potential now for leafhoppers in alfalfa, that that's going to be a much greater problem? Because I, I have rarely seen anyone treat for weevil in second cutting alfalfa. For weevils or leafhoppers? Well, I talked about both. If people treat second cutting, they're treating the new growth. You you. I don't know why you would be spraying second cutting for weevil further along, you know, so, so the, the, the weevils are finishing. As far as leafhopper, they're another pest that gets blown in from the, from the south, and then once they establish here, it's, it's been a while since we've had a bad leaf, leafhopper year, and they tend to be um, a lot worse under dry conditions because their feeding is exacerbated. You know, once you start into July, you think a little bit more about potato leafhopper. I haven't had any calls about leafhopper, and and Jeff may know, you know, what those uh, if some of the re recent fronts have been good for leafhopper to move in. Chris, just to follow up on that, uh, and it, it, I should have mentioned it during my talk. We we had we did have a transport event here over the last forty eight hours. Okay, uh, and it can do conducive situation, and more than that, the of course with this tropical air mass, it was literally out of Central America, something we rarely see in Michigan. So. There's a there's a at least a possibility or potential for uh, insect and also disease uh, wow. that we like rust see. and things yeah exactly that we do yeah. not see very very, uh, very rarely here in Michigan it was a it was a very very abnormal unusual situation uh, that that we observed through yeah strength. so the bottom line again with insects they're not like Christie's weeds they're not like always there in the same spot it really pays to scout to scout for insects and use our use our thresholds whether it's wheat or corn or beans fantastic is there any other questions from any of the other specialists I, I will say I know Manny is uh, I see him I saw him on just a second ago we are having more replant down in the southwest than I thought originally too we uh, we're getting some air where obviously drowned out spots we're working on right now but uh it turns out some of those beans that were planted on uh, cool wet soils were uh, a little less than perfect stands and i think people are addressing some of that right now and then we've had corn on on colder and wetter soils that uh were early planted in may okay okay i assume when you, people are replanting soybeans they are refilling right they're not like we don't recommend like to tear down the stand and replant at least for soybeans that you just go and you refill yeah i think the the only time i've seen that in soybeans was when we had just literally pounded areas were flooded mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah most of that has been been uh just kind of fill in patch in and in soybean we got to remember that yeah i mean unless the stand is really poor we might be surprised the other yield potential that did we get. One more okay. question came in for Kurt. It says, a few years ago, MSU did a research project concerning N amount and timing in corn. Do you know if the impact of rain was considered in that research project? Yeah, I think, 
you know, we did a couple projects dealing with that, and most of those should be posted on, on our website. But, yes, we looked at the impact of uh, V4 to V6 Cydrus timing versus, like, a V11, V12 Cydrus timing. And we both considered dry conditions leading up to each and wet conditions leading up to each and dry conditions after each and wet conditions after each. And we talk about it in that specific paper, and that's posted posted online. What is that web address? Uh, that would be at soil.msu.edu. Then you can go under bulletins, reports, and it'll probably be under corn. Bruce, it's been a full morning. I know, but it's been a good one too. We got covered a lot of territory today. So. <laughs> You're not a kitten. I, I want to say thanks to Jeff and Kurt. You guys did a great job today. So it's after eight o'clock. So I'm going to say adios, everybody. We'll see you next week. Okay. Thank you, everyone.